for this episode of the Tucker Max Experiences, we talked to a guy, Jeff Gonzalez. Jeff has become a good friend of mine. It's so funny. I've been doing jujitsu with him for like a year and a half. Um, and I've been helping him. You know, he's a blue belt and I'm a brown belt. So I've been helping him in jujitsu. And quite honestly, kind of whipping his ass, of course. I would hope I'm a fucking brown belt. Uh, and I didn't realize who he was. But uh, until about four months ago, he's a retired uh, Navy SEAL and spent years you know, in the SEALs and now uh, owns a company called Trident Concepts or Tricon. And he kind of teaches civilians. Um, he mainly focuses on carry conceal right teaches civilians a bunch of stuff and i'd heard his name and i knew his company he's like one of the kind of higher status badasses in in of the special forces guys who teach civilians now he's one of the the really good ones i had just never put two and two together i didn't know this this uh dude whose ass i was kicking was an actual badass with a, a pistol and so when i figured it out i was like oh dude you know, like help me out, whatever. We started talking, and um, he has absolutely revolutionized. I don't want to say he's helped me a lot in, in my EDC uh, sort of knowledge and um, uh, and getting my EDC set up. You know, EDC meaning everyday carry. So, like, what do I have on me every day? What holster do I use? What pistol do I have? What knives do I have? Uh, what other things do I carry? Why do I carry them? This is one of those things where. When I first got into self-defense and guns, I was like, it didn't um, occur to me how important this was. But then, you know, it once I realized, like, oh, like, probably I'm not going to be getting in a fight uh, with uh, people at my ranch when I have time to go get all my gear and get set up. And I'm going to be set up perfectly and they're just going to walk in and I shoot them. Uh, like, that's not how it's going to happen, right? If something were to happen, probably it's going to be... I'm not at home, I'm going to be out, and the only tools I'm going to have are the ones on me. Uh, so which tools do I carry, and why, and how do I carry them, is a supremely important question. Jeff helped set up uh, the, the call it the low vis or carry program for, uh, uh, for Navy SEALs, um, and he's helped other agencies, he really knows his stuff. Um, so if EDC is a thing you want to learn about, this is the guy. I had just started be getting serious about concealed carry, right? Yeah. The last, as we've talked about, yeah. but like the last um, year and a half, two years, I got very, very serious about self-defense, about protection. And like, uh, I've kind of gone on an EDC journey from like not care, even though I had my LTC yeah. um, and I had a pistol, literally never once had it in my truck or concealed on me because pre COVID, it's like I live in America, everything's safe, we're fine, right? right? And then summer of 2020 and shit's just getting worse and worse. And now it's like, okay, like I need to be serious and okay, right. And then I started diving. I'm like, okay, well, you carry a gun, how hard can it be? And it's like, oh, hold <laughs> on, right? Like you start going into that world and you realize it actually can be super complicated. And then also, there's a lot of weird emotional stuff about. Oh my God. I'm so gun. glad you mentioned that. Okay. So let me, before, let's start, let me get some background. So, you Navy SEAL, right? Yep. East and West Coast teams. And then uh, can we talk about like you kind of developed uh, a lot of the Lovis stuff that SEALs <laughs> use, right? Are you a part of that team? Yeah. So one of the things that I had to do early in my career was deploy into non-permissive environments and carry concealed to the performance so, of the right, So my, we're talking civilians. Non-permissive yeah. means like war zones, basically. Well, Or would be war zones if they knew who you were. Could be. But right. sometimes these were places that um, – like you as a, a regular American citizen couldn't even get in. Right. Couldn't even be there. Like what would it just – not where you serve. What's an example of a non-permissive environment? Uh, Afghanistan would be <laughs> a non-permissive environment, but it's also classified as a war zone. Yeah. But uh, there was a time when it was just considered a non-permissive environment. Uh, yeah. Places like uh, a lot of the former Soviet bloc unions, uh, yeah, they yeah. are considered non-permissive yeah. environments. Kazakhstan, yes, Armenia, exactly, exactly, Azerbaijan. Exactly, exactly. Right. Um, you go down to Central and South America, there's plenty of places oh, yeah, that yeah. are considered non-permissive environments. Shit, most of Mexico, probably? Most of Mexico, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. All right. So, so non-permissive essentially means like it's very dangerous. Yes. And a good way to correlate this for the private citizen is that like think of a non-permissive environment as a gun-free zone. Like you can't carry there. <laughs> right. You can't carry there. Right, right. But I had to carry and it, the the risk was so, you know, like the, the government was like mm, – Carry, but don't get caught. Right, right. Okay, yeah. so so you and you and other people with you had to develop a program. Low vis means 
it's it's deeper than concealed carry, right? Exactly. They're not the same thing. Explain kind of, the difference. Uh, so, like, you could think of low vis as like covert, right. and then everybody else is concealed, right? Like, that's, like I'm concealed, but I'm not really covert, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. like anyone who's looking like, is going to see. It, like everyday carry is probably just going to be concealed. Yes, like it's like think of con- think of covert carry as. You don't want anyone to know you have a, gu- you can't, a gun like, or a, a good way to think of covert carry as like a undercover agent, uh, an undercover like narc. Yes. Like he's got to go in and make a drug deal. Right. That's got to be covert. Okay. All you right. cannot have any. So, well, the, the point I'm trying to make though is so people understand like there, yeah. there in a lot of uh, people who will talk about EDC, which means everyday carry, which right. a lot of people don't even like, what's EDC? I'm like, I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, they'll talk about this stuff, but a lot of them really, eh, I'm not trying to be rude, don't know what the fuck they're talking about, right? Like there's a lot of dudes who are badass military guys, let's <laughs> say, right? Yep. Who don't really know much about concealed carry because they know how to like put on a chest rig and carry a big gun and kick in a door or, you know, fight in like a combat set. And they might be absolute world-class badasses at that. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily convert carry over to either a low vis or a concealed carry system, Absolutely. right? They're Absolutely. different things. It, it's very true. Like, and even back then, there was no manual on this. There's yeah. no manual. I mean, back this was like the late 80s. Right. So there was no resources to go to. It was all OJT. The right. only people that were Hold doing on, I don't, what is OJT mean? on the job training. Okay, I got you. So there the only people that actually had any structure to the uh, to the subject matter were plainclothes detectives. Yeah. That's it. They were the only ones that were quote unquote concealed carry right. at the time. But they're like carrying revolvers they, back then, and, right? And even then they carried in a business suit and it wasn't really concealed. Yeah, it was right. like, you know, as soon as they took their jacket off. Right, it's right here. Exactly. Yeah. Exa- like a shoulder yeah. holster. Exactly. So that was it. They were yeah. the only people that were doing it. And uh, the other thing I tell people is like that time period, it wasn't easy to carry concealed partly because – the guns weren't designed for it. Well, the guns weren't designed for it. There wasn't a manual for it. There wasn't yeah. any kind of like organized instruction, but also the equipment didn't support it. Like there wasn't a lot of holster manufacturers back then. Yeah. So your choices were very limited. And, you know, like uh, the very first time I carried in a non-permissive environment, I carried without a holster. I put my 226 just in my pants because the, there was no holsters that would accommodate a 226 yeah. that were con- like inside the waistband, yeah. first of all. That were good. Okay. And uh, the other thing I laugh about this story was like when I first got this, uh, when I first took this, I didn't really have a choice. So I was voluntold to do it. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that was cool about it was the ops chief goes, hey, go down to the armory and get your loadout, get your concealed carry loadout. I'm like, okay, cool. I go down to the armory and the guys didn't know what I was talking about. They were looking at me like, <laughs> what? And I was like, yeah, you know, like the, you know, it's like, oh, I think I know. And he reached into a drawer. The chief reached in a drawer and pulled out a holster, tossed it to me. I was like, here you go. Yeah. And I looked at it like it was a foreign object, like I'd never seen anything like it because it was the first time I'd ever held and even seen an inside the waistband holster. Until then, everything I did was on the waistband, like either a drop leg, tactical thigh So you're rig. like older than fucking Neptune. <laughs> Maybe not that old, <laughs> but I'm pretty old. <laughs> that, that, I mean, like, but that's right, true. Yeah, like that's that's, that, that puts context into kind of like the – like I was – I started this journey at almost like what would be considered the very beginning – uh, in a, in the concealed right. carry world. Yeah, definitely, right. Yeah, so, okay, and so then you got out of the Navy, and now you've been 20 years teaching civilians yeah. firearm stuff, focusing a lot on concealed carry and civilians. In the stuff, last right? – absolutely. Like, So the, the, the way that it worked was we used to only teach this to government-level units. We right. never taught this outside to the private sector. Right. Um, and kind of like a funny story, the way this, this worked was I couldn't teach it on the East Coast because uh, the Navy facilities – we're not happy that we were going to be doing unorthodox training. Yeah. So they're like, no, take that shit somewhere else. Yeah. So the first time that we ran a government level class, we actually had to go up to Quantico and use Quantico's range. That's and, FBI. Yeah. Well, no, that was actually the uh, HRP from the Marine Corps. Okay. So the Marine Corps has their, the embassy. Yeah. The, the guys okay, that do gotcha, the embassy, yeah, the yeah. HRP guys. So they had their own facility up there at Quantico. Yeah. So we went up there and, you know, we gave them a couple seats in the class yeah. and did the class. So it was great. Awesome. Um, one of the staff sergeants that was in that class, PCS, or moved over to uh, California, went to uh, Marine Corps Base out Camp Pilton out there. And so what ended up happening was he called me up and he's like, hey, I'm, I've got a similar kind of position. I'm in the intelligence field out here yeah. and we need the training. Teach us. Yeah. We Teach need us the training. Exactly. Exactly. So okay. I, I went out there, but Camp Pendleton didn't want anything to do with this. So yeah. we had to go and use a civilian range, which but, happened. So just quickly, like why would a military bit, just because, because it's unsafe? Like, they think it's unsafe? Exactly. Or? It's so foreign. It's so new. And oh, we're yeah, doing yeah. things that are different. What they called it unorthodox. Okay. Because right. it wasn't traditional range training, like on the line, very, very stoic in manner, you know, controlled. Yeah. yeah right. It wasn't two guys standing. Yeah, there. exactly. Okay. It was very different yeah. at the, for the time. Yeah. So then we ended up having to use a, a law enforcement range right. nearby, and we 
gave some seats. Every one of these was like we gave seats to the hosting range facility. Yeah. So we gave seats to this uh, this police department out there in California, and they, the same thing happened. They yeah. called me up they and said, "Can you train, come out and come do train this? our under- exactly. Guys. Yeah, exactly? Okay. And, and so and now you've literally written the book, Concealed Carry Manual, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. The manual. I just want to be very clear. My company had nothing to do with this book. The content's amazing. The cover, as you can tell, is an abortion. <laughs> Thanks. This is also this this came out a little bit before uh, our our uh, our meeting of sorts. So I do I am I am regretful. My company still existed, dude. I know, I know, I know. I'm a little regretful (laughs) because I'm probably never going to leave this shit down. That's just proof that I will get great info from anywhere, even book covers (laughs) that look like they. I mean, it says looks like from the '80s. Like you're stuck in the The '80s. '80s. (laughs) That's like the clothing that I was wearing back then. I'm going to link the, the thing in the show notes, the book. Unfortunately, you have to buy it. With, just cut the cover off like I will and then it'll be fine. <laughs> um, all right. No, but let's talk about the info. Okay. okay. So, so yeah. I, I, the details on what matters, I just want people to understand. Like when I try and learn from, from about something, yeah. I don't go to people who have the best credentials necessarily. I want to go to the people who've done what I'm trying to learn. Yeah. Right? Like, and I'm a t- I talked about, about this with Tim. Like I've learned a ton from Tim Kennedy. Yeah. I mean, like fundamentals, and uh, he's amazing. Oh, I love him. Hand to hand, dude. But like, he doesn't teach low vis well and yeah. EDC well. I don't think. Like, he teaches ca- carrying in a uh, uh, like a fanny pack. Yeah, and, yeah. And that's where I started. I actually started yeah. doing that, and then uh, went to Bill Rapier's course, the Force on Force course, and tested it out. And I got my ass handed to me, and I'm like, this ain't gonna work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I need to go find people who understand yeah. EDC and concealed yeah. carry. Yeah. And so I found you. Yeah. Which ironically, we've been doing jujitsu yeah, together for like a year, and didn't even know you were like the guy for this. <laughs> I do kind of run low profile yeah. still. There you go. So that's kind of a hard, uh, a hard thing for me to get out of. It's terrible. Like I'm a, I'm a dysfunctional in- introvert. Right. Basically, yeah. in my business, I have to be an extrovert, but I'm, a, I suck at it. Um. So yeah, like um, you know, the EDC world is one of these things, and and it's very unique in the sense that not one size fits all. Yeah. Like you and I, we might be the same body structure, whatever, but yeah. you're going to probably have different needs than I am. Yeah. And, you know, you add genders in there, you add age in there. You, in some places, they're restricted on what they can carry. You know, yeah. there's certain firearm restrictions. So, you know, we've adapted. A, we, we basically took our mentality from when I was doing it at the unit level, the government yeah. level. And because my guys might be deployed or the, these units might go to the Middle East, which was a hot spot at the time. Yeah. But we have another scenario called rest of world, R-O-W, means that we also have to keep an eye out on all these other fucktards yeah. throughout the rest of the country, yeah. the rest of the world. They might decide to get froggy and jump while yeah. we're over here. So our guys would then go and forward deploy to these other places and start doing battlefield prep. You right. know? So they might be in the Middle East one week, and then the very next week they're in you know northern, eastern Europe. Yeah. And then they totally go different, totally different fire, environment, yeah. totally different EDC needs. And then uh-huh. they go from there down to Central or South America. Right. And they're everywhere. The problem that we had at the time was there was like a like, again, the only people that were doing EDC, like when you think of EDC sometimes or, or low vis, you think like of a plainclothes detective or like a bodyguard, yeah. like a Hollywood bodyguard. Totally, totally. Right. And those are such so limited and they're scope, very narrow, very narrow. Yeah. It's not to say that you can't do it that way, but every day, yeah. no, nah, that's just not going to work. All right. So let's get into the details. I, I, yeah. I want to ask you questions. Like I'm coming still – I'm not like remembering what it's like to be a beginner. I'm still a beginner. Okay. Right? I, I'm just a little later stage beginner. For sure. Right. All right. So let's talk about – first, let's talk about gun. Okay. Right? So tell me about – so I have – uh, Sig 320 X carry. It's all Gucci'd out and custom. Yes. You know, with a, an SRO. So let's talk about, we, you can talk about this gun or what gun should people carry? Because like there's a lot of, there's the, the, the tiny ones. Yeah, yeah. it's clear. There's, no. a, there's the tiny ones, the subcompacts. Right I can see this. Oh, right. There's the subcompacts, compact. This would be considered a compact, yeah. right? So the subcompacts would be like a P365, right? Um, I would say that that's a micro. Or the Hellcat? Oh, micro? That's a micro. Yeah, okay. so it's compact, subcompact, micro compact. Okay, so, micro. Uh, 320 would definitely be a compact. Right. A 365 XL right. would, would be, be a, a, com- a subcompact. subcompact. Then the 365 would be a micro. Okay, I got you. All right, so there's kind of three size. Would you ever carry a full size as a concealed carry? Does that make any sense? Mm, probably not for me. Unless you're a big dude. Exactly. If right. I was like, uh, you know, like Matt. Yeah, ops mat. Yeah, yeah right. I, yeah, I can get so away Matt's, with carrying a Matt's like six two yeah, two fifty exactly. or yeah, something. Yeah, I could carry a rifle in yeah. a sense, you know. So <laughs> he's also fat. So that's, a, that's your way of calling him fat, Matt. I did not say that, <laughs> uh, but um, 
you know, he's got more real estate, yeah, so he can yeah. get away with it. Yeah, For yeah. me, uh, that was one of the other critical things is that my body composition is I don't have a lot of real estate. Yeah, so yeah. I have to make – I have to take advantage of size, and yeah. that means that I go small. All right. So so walk me through what – as a civilian, yeah. what do I think about when carrying – like when yeah. picking the gun to carry? So there's like cat- – there's like criterion. And right. the first thing I talk about is magazine capacity. That's okay. going to be the driving force. Magazine. Right. Right. At a minimum – you want 10 rounds. Okay. So that opens up the doors to get down to- The micros. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because right now, statistically speaking, it's very unlikely that you're going to have to shoot more than 10 rounds. Yeah. Uh, most of the most of more these- More than 10, that's like a gunfight. Exactly. That's a That's the gun different, fight. that's exactly correct. It's not an encounter, it's a gunfight. Yeah. It's a gunfight, it's an exchange of ammunition right. between two parties, <laughs> right. right? That's right. a big difference. Yeah. Whereas most of these are dealt with like two to five rounds max. You know, that's you firing because you got- Someone's attacking you. Exactly. Exactly. Two to five rounds on target, targets neutralized, or you target stop shoes away, right. and yeah. now you're done. Right. So so ten rounds is like the minimum. And what that allowed people to do is like because there was like this this idea that if you didn't carry this, right. you were gonna die. There used to be an idea that you, there was a perfect Exactly, EDC, yeah. exactly. Okay. And it was like a larger frame firearm that was not easy for smaller frame people to carry. Yeah. So ten rounds at a minimum. Uh, the next thing that I tell people is um, the the cartridge should be more than likely nine millimeter. Yeah. Um, 380s are are becoming much more reliable in the firearm platform, but terminal performance, mm, still kind of so, questionable. W- hold on. Terminal performance means like, does it hurt the body? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Does it perform? Does it stop the threat? In other right. words. And so that is measured in a lot of different ways. Most of the time it's penetration and expansion. Yeah. Does it penetrate deep enough? Does it expand enough? Yeah. Um, the 380s are... I wouldn't want to be shot by 380, but when I compare a 380 to a 9, 9 is just going to outperform it yeah. every day. Yeah. And that also flips to the other side of this pendulum, which is like 40 cal, 45 ACP. Right. Um, those are great. Cal- those well, are the great. The three main ones that people are going to decide, 9 yeah. millimeter, 40, 40, 45. Exactly. So it comes down to this. Of those three, why would I choose one over the other? And it boils down to the bullets. Yeah. I can carry more bullets in a 9. Yeah. So the same size frame. So if I were to go with the same size frame firearm um, and, you know, if – it holds a 10 round magazine for nine millimeter. It's probably only going to hold maybe eight for a 40 and maybe only six for a 45. So yeah. I'm losing ammo, but I'm not getting anything in return terminal performance wise. What we've learned over no, the years. What you're saying is the actual impact of a 40 and 45 on the body is pretty close to a nine millimeter. They're so close at these, the, the, the performance, the design of the new era of hollow point bullets. Right. That's like these. These yes, are like exactly. the Hornady or yeah, Federal whatever. Exactly. Those yeah. look like HSTs. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah. The the design of the new modern era bullet or hollow point bullets is gotten to the point where the difference between those two or those three Minimal. is so marked. Yeah, exactly. So right. what so in other words, you're giving up the capacity to carry when you go to those bigger, but you're not getting anything as far as terminal performance. You're not getting anything that's so whoosh right. impressive. So as a civilian, yeah. generally speaking, I'm better off with more slightly less powerful bullets than less so, a lot less slightly more powerful bullets. So think of when you think of power, and that's another kind of Con, common thing that a lot of times we talk about, that t- the, there used to be this thing called a power factor. They used right. to measure bullets by power factor. We've learned that that's not as accurate as it used to be. So rather than think of power, think of performance. And performance is now oh, driven yeah. by, there's two metrics, penetration and expansion. Yeah. If it's me- Because that's how you neutralize human bodies. Exactly. You've got to hit the vital anatomy. If okay. you're not hitting the vital anatomy, it doesn't matter. So yeah. it's got to penetrate deep enough to hit the vital anatomy and it's got to expand. It doesn't have to expand. Because a bullet, even if it doesn't expand, it's still going to destroy tissue. Yeah. But if it expands, it's going to destroy Destroys more. more. Exactly. Right. So that's those are the that's what I'm looking for performance wise. And when you measure them across the board, the, you know you're not like a 45 will expand slightly more than a nine, but there's not like any evidence that it shows that it's going to stop a fight any faster than a nine would. Okay. So even though they're both going to expand. Right. So not... I'd much rather have 10 bullets exactly. of nine than six bullets of 45. Exactly. Okay. Because I the other you. thing that I tell people is like 10, why, why the number 10? Well, there's a lot of reasons I can carry more bullets at 10 than I can at 45 at six. But the other thing that you got to keep in mind is that as a civilian, even, even, even as somebody that's a trained professional, there's a lot of variables you can't control. Um, you know, you may find yourself, in a situation that you're super stressed and you you miss as a result, yeah. you know, or maybe you hit, but you get peripheral hits, yeah. right? Uh, or another reason is that there is more than one bad guy. Okay. So those are the three other reasons why I like the nine in a you like ten- more bullets. Exactly. Yeah. Because more of that. bullets is always better. Yeah. If I miss or if the bullets aren't working or if I got more than one threat, 
I need more bullets. Yeah. Okay. But there's a point of diminishing returns as well when you go to the other side of the spectrum. Yeah, that's why I don't carry an extra mag. Yeah, like, exactly. That's the, you know, that was, and that's the thing. Like, everybody's like, well, if you don't carry an extra mag, you're going to die on the streets. Well, not maybe if you're getting in gunfights. If, if you're like, if you're going shopping in the Bakar market, maybe, maybe, okay? <laughs> right, North Hollywood shooting. Yeah, exactly. Shootout, maybe, maybe bags. we can make a case for that. But I think 10 is like the sweet spot. Yeah. I find that good. Nine, the cartridge of choice. And then that, what that allows people to do is like freeze them up to look at all, all the, the different size pistols. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So let's talk about pistols. So we got, would nine millimeter for most people is almost the best choice. I agree. Okay. So then. Size wise, what's the thing to look at is really how it fits your body or what am I looking for size wise? I think a lot of times it's how you can shoot. Mm -hmm. Like, um, let me back up. It's implied that it's going to be a small compact frame or smaller. Right. So that's going to help with concealment. Right. But do you get like, are there, are there elements to a smaller gun that make it more desirable over a larger gun? And yes, there are for me because a smaller gun just allows me to carry in more discreet manners in more different circumstances. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can't carry that on an ankle holster. Yeah. I can't put that in a pair of uh, board trunk shorts. No. I can't, no. you know, so there's, there's limitations to what I can do. So I like to keep my options open. So the small micro compact pistols have come a long way and they give me that option. But it may not be the gun that I want to carry with me every day as well. Yeah. Uh, an example was like the first couple months of the pandemic when things were really crazy. I was carrying a three six five, the Sig three six P three six five is my standard gun. Yeah. And when shit was crazy out there, I'm like, you know what? I'm you want more bullets? I, well, the risk the the risk was elevated. Yeah. And we have what we call a threat matrix. Yeah. Right. And a threat matrix measures your perceived risk with the uh, the threat scenarios. And so I'm like, yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna step up my game. And I went to carrying a three twenty compact as my daily carry. Yeah. Uh, things kind of calmed down a little bit, and I went ahead and moved back down to a 365, but now I carry the 365 XL. Yeah. And I would say more than— And what, 15 in that or 12? 12. Okay. Yeah, and so a little bit best of both worlds. Yeah. Now. So with the, um, you know, it, but the other thing that I'm giving up is that I can't carry it in an ankle holster. I can't carry it in a pocket holster. But if I needed to, I just carry the 365, the standard one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, going to that 365 was a nice— compromise between the 320 compact and the 365 standard. Okay. And that's what I tell people is that you're probably going to be making some compromises here and there. So here, here's what I've heard and what I did. And I think this works. Tell me what you think. So you want to, uh, when I was kind of picking my pistol, I went to a good range. I think I went to the Reds up north Yep. and they had like, they got tons yeah. of guns there and you can rent them all. Yeah. And so I literally, I think I annoyed the hell out of the guy there because they had seriously had like 60 pistols. Yeah. I shot everyone. <laughs> uh, that's not annoying. That's that's every... good. That's good consumer no, but buying the dude, trends. The dude there was like, oh, yeah, seriously? Sure. I'm like, this is the Glock 19, this is the 19L or whatever. Yeah. Like, I want to shoot them all. I want to know. What's the difference? <laughs> and so I shot them all. Yeah. And because uh, what I was told was as long as you have a reliable brand, one of the good yep. ones, which like so SIG, true. FN, yep. Smith & Wesson, uh, Glock. Yep. And there's like one other Springfield, I think. Those six, uh, right? Or those five? Yeah, probably. I think, let's see. So Sig, Smith, Glock. H&K is probably oh, in yeah, there. Oh, yeah, H&K, right. H&K. Uh, yeah, so there's a, there's about five or six very high reputable brands that make concealed-friendly right, guns. Right. So Not the, everybody makes yeah, concealed-friendly. Yeah, those aren't the only ones, but yeah. those are the big ones you're going to find at every gun store. And the, the, yeah, you, for sure. So the, 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 the guy would tell you, he's like, just shoot them all. Yeah. And the one you like the best is the right one. I think at the beginner level, that has that that makes a lot of sense because as a beginner, you really don't know what you don't know. So what feels good to you at that moment mm -hmm. might be a good start. But right. what I tell people is that as you expand your knowledge base and as you start to train and get a little bit better, you might start to see the l small little things that you didn't know existed. Yeah, but start to make a difference. Exactly. They start to make a difference. Like size. So like even though that's a compact frame with all the uh, – like extended features that you have in there, it, right. it does make it a little bit harder or m maybe not harder, but more noticeable that you're carrying it. One of the things I try to tell people is that if it's, if it's, if it's going to, anything that's uncomfortable will eventually, it's like that little nagging thing that just you're gonna gets. You're going to stop to, we're going to get to that in whole Okay. Okay. Hold okay. on. We're, Good. I, we're enough. deep dive in that. Deep holster. dive it is. All right. So, so then, so, so if someone's out there like, okay, I, I need to get a, a gun, I'm going to do nine millimeter. Mm -hmm. And then, so you just tell it, shoot the micros, shoot the subcompacts, shoot the compacts. Yeah. And whichever ones feel the most comfortable to yeah. you is where you start. Yeah. And here's, here's a couple of ideas about what we, how we might define comfort. Right. Right. Comfort might be defined as how it fits in my hand. Uh-huh. 
Like that makes me feel comfortable. Like yeah. I can hold and secure the gun. Right. Comfort might be also how I can see the sights. Some, yeah. some guns have better sights than others. Comfort might also be defined as how the gun shoots when I'm, when I'm firing it. Like yeah. uh, maybe one gun has a snappier recoil than the yeah. other. Yeah. So those are maybe some suggestions about yeah. defining comfort. Yeah. Cause comfort can be also a little trigger pull, right? Yes. Trigger, trigger. Like I hate the Glock trigger. Yeah, I, just, so, I couldn't deal with it. Like I would say trigger weight because. Well, so explain what weight because so, most like, people don't know. The, yeah, so the weight of the trigger is how much pounds it takes. How actually, much force do you have to use the exactly, pull? Exactly, yeah. force. And that's measured in pounds. Yeah. And I would say for a what we consider to be a combat carry type gun, I would want probably nothing lower than four pounds. Right. Like four and a half to five pounds is like a sweet spot. I think for a lot of people it's smooth, it's crisp, it does everything you need to do. Heavy trigger pulls like the double actions of the old, they had 12 to 15 pounds. Of, right. Perceived pull weight. That's so, like the 1911, right? No, that's just the opposite. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, like, the, yeah what, what, it's like a SIG 226, a Beretta 92F, the double yeah, action. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, the 1911 is is probably on the other end of the spectrum with like a very light, like two and a half to three pound trigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're super right. So, so double action means it has the, the... The hammer, exposed hammer. Right, exposed hammer. And then this is considered a striker fire, That's right? a striker fire. Exactly. So where there's no exposed hammer. No exposed hammer. hammer. D- does that matter one way or the other? Should I think it think does. About that? I think it does. And here's the reason why. I... Grew up, uh, you know, my naval career was all with a double action, both the Berettas. Cause right, I, so the exposed hammer. Exactly. Okay. The long – and here's the thing about a double action trigger is double action means that there's two separate actions. So the first action is the heavy, pull. long 12 yeah, to 14 pull the pound pull. Then after that, the hammer stays cocked automatically yeah. and every shot after that is fired from single action. And it's single action, yeah, well, light. It's light, very light. light. So in other words, it goes from 12 pounds to maybe three pounds. Yeah. And so now that as a shooter, you have to be able to uh, modulate Adjust. modulate your oh, pressure on the trigger. Yeah. Because if you are if you train to pull that double action, which you have to do a lot because it's much heavier, yeah. you have to be able to pump the brakes when you get to the single action. Otherwise, you're applying excessive force to that super force. light trigger. And then you're going to pull the outside. Oh, yeah, it goes all over the place. So – do I want to saddle a new shooter with those two? No, no exactly. way. Exactly. Yeah. You're much better off, in my opinion, with a striker fired or a single action type. I wouldn't even recommend a single action because there's additional controls that you have to learn. Yeah. But a striker fire gun, most of the time, uh, is the best first gun to start with only because it's got the same trigger pull each and every time. It has fewer controls that the lear- the new shooter has to learn. Yeah. So it's generally an easier gun to start Everything, with. Uh, all the brands I just mentioned, almost all of the pistols they make are striker fire. This almost, is a, yeah, right. Yeah. Like SIGs are mostly striker. Glocks yeah. are, I think, all, all striker, striker fire. fire. Yeah. yeah, Smith & Wesson, all, like Berries, FN, yeah. HK. Okay, right. Yeah. So they they all make... It's just, is there an exposed hammer or not? Like yeah. exposed? Okay, yeah, yeah, all right. Exactly. So most people should just go striker. I like. I agree. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not pushing them in a wrong direction. Yeah. There was this perceived idea that the heavier trigger pull was safe. Safer. Yeah. I don't think that's not true, is it? I, well, true in that case is subjective. Yeah. If it makes you feel safer, okay. But is it safer? It's no, because, actually safer. because under under the exactly under the body's fight or flight conditions, the grip strength sure that you're applying. Yeah, you're right. not, yeah, exactly. Okay. So it's not technically safer. Okay. All right. I got you. All right. So then I go shoot them all. I pick a striker fire pistol. I pick the X carry, but whatever. Whatever. Like they're all okay. Um, so the next consideration would be holsters. Holster, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is Okay, I'm just going to tell it. This is way, way, way more important than I thought at the beginning. Like, it's almost as important as the gun, right? Right, 100%. Like, maybe more, or it kind of mm, depends. Maybe not. The, if you're picking one of the six big brands, it all of a sudden matter. But the holster is huge. True, true. So, I forget what company this is. This is one I'm testing out. So, all right. So, uh, he, this is, I, I want to bring up, the, the, let, me, let me see if I've identified all the big holster debates. One is the material. Right, so a lot of people say it's got to be all Kydex, right? Okay, which is uh, I don't necessarily agree with. This is you can tell. I don't know if you can see here. Yeah, this is like three quarters. See how it's got the inside, yeah. right? So it's kind of Kydex, but then it has the comfortable back shell. Mm-hmm. Because, dude, like, I mean, I got like the black point, like the you know the Bill Rapier's four to three o'clock. Like the best inside the waistband Kydex holsters are so fucking uncomfortable. <laughs> like I can't. They dig into me. Yeah. And I hate yeah. them. Like I don't want to carry. Yeah. This I'm not gonna say this is comfortable, yeah. but like for a holster, it's very comfortable. So you know? um so here's the thing. I, I understand how comfort is a big thing, but this would also like any kind of hybrid holsters we consider to be unsafe. And the reason that they're unsafe is that this material right here right. 
with time becomes extremely pliable. Yeah. Uh, your body composition will then move Push this it, yeah. into the path of the firearm as it's going into the holster. So particularly with a new shooter, what they run the risk of is that this, especially with that nice kind of pointed aspect, yeah. moves inside the trigger guard as they're pushing the firearm into the holster. Oh, and then an it'll accidental fire discharge. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we, it, it's happened enough to where we deem these to be unsafe simply because there's other options. Yeah. So hybrid holsters I don't recommend. Um, I do like how you've upgraded to the metal clips because this came yeah. with plastic yeah, clips. Right. Uh-huh. And plastic clips. Just, Useless. Yeah, they come off very easily, especially when you start to tussle. Yeah. You start tussling, oh, yeah, you see right, right, things change for you. Um, so when, when it comes to holsters, there are options. You have all leather, all kydex, and the hybrids. Yeah. Um, there actually is nylon. We don't see nylon holsters anymore. And if you see a nylon holster, usually I always joke. And I was like, hey, the 80s call. They want right, their shit right. back. Right. So um, it's really those three. Um, this would be probably third, in my right. opinion. Mm-hmm. Leather would be second. Kydex would be... All, you would pick all leather over a hybrid. Yeah. Really? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, well, I would pick leather as my primary. The only reason why is that I live in a very hot climate where I produce a lot of sweat. Yeah. And so sweat- It deforms it. It doesn't deform it, but right? what it does is it creates more, it creates a, a suction. Yeah. Uh, the, the leather becomes very pliable because of the moisture seeping into it. And it actually kind of like, it slows my draw stroke down. I mean, I, in my case, it slows my draw stroke down to the point where I notice it. And the average person, they're never going to see that. Yeah. But I do. So I would, I would, in my environment here in- in central Texas, I would carry, I carry Kydex. Uh, yeah. And because Kydex is impervious to sweat, it's going to stay the same material all the yeah, time. Of course. So that's, that's the thing. I understand how some holsters are uncomfortable. And yeah. that's what I tell people is that you should be prepared to go through probably about four to six different holsters until Bro, you find the one that you like. I have, I'm not kidding. Yeah. I have, a, you know, those big buckets. Yeah. I have buckets of Imagine like, 20 years. I do. 20 years in the commercial market of, of I'm actually. I'm not joking. I bought yeah. 40 holsters. I, I have gone through. I uh, mean, I have enough money I can afford it. Yeah. But like, this is disastrous. So what I tell people is this. Like, when you're looking for holsters, there's 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 requirements that the holster has to have. Right. The first requirement is that it must adequately protect the trigger, which in this case, you can see how. Yeah. This doesn't need to be here anymore. You can see how, um, you know, this has got adequate protection for the trigger right yeah, here. It covers the whole trigger. Exactly. Right, yeah. Exactly. So you want no nothing that could get into the trigger. Uh, the second thing is that you want to make sure that it adequately retains the gun. Yeah. So you can see how you have an extra passive aggressive um, or passive um, passive aggressive holster. <laughs> get the fuck out you of here. You suck. You <laughs> suck. You suck. <laughs> She's ashamed yeah, to retain you're the holster. Shaming you. <laughs> um, but you have an active a measure here. There's the Kydex forms a shell which has features that lock into the certain parts of the features of the gun. Right. But you can also have this retention screw right here yeah, that allows you to more, tighten yeah. it and loosen it. Mm-hmm. Just uh, what I always tell people is if you have this additional retention, just be very mindful of it because it's it's the hardware here has been prone to over time loosen yeah. and it just falls out yeah. and you just lose it. So just be mindful of that. But adjustable retention is nice. Uh, I don't necessarily consider it a requirement because if you're picking a good holster, it should fit the gun. So that's the key right. is that when you choose... A, does it have to be custom? Okay. But, well, in in Kydex, in the Kydex, and in, in the leather hole, or I mean, they're uh, molded to molds. Exactly. But I'm saying, like, uh, can you buy an off the shelf? This is for a Glock 17, Absolutely. or this is for your Glock 17. Yes. Now, if you do something to your Glock that might change something, right. then maybe. Uh, okay. But if you're getting an out of the box factory stock, yeah, yeah. easy day. Um, so the, the second is retention. The third is that I needed to sit on my body and stay on my body. So yeah. that's going to be how it attaches. And we'll talk like, about belts come next. Yeah. Yeah, belt, yeah. Belts would be a big thing. So you've you've made an upgrade here, uh, and which I think is solid, which is the, the DC clips. Yeah, the, the discrete DC, carry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, these guys are great. Uh, I do like them. They can be a pain in the ass, you know, beginning because they're so good. Dude, you can't get them off your belt. You got to yeah. learn how to push down. Yeah, it you took gotta, me a while. You got to really work it. So uh, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of their product. I use them on just about all of my Kydex holsters as well. Uh, and then the last thing is grip. You've got to be able to get a firing grip with the gun in the holster. So that means that if any part of the holster itself... So hold on. You mean like this? Yes. So okay. if you were to put this in the holster... So I need to be able to acquire firing grip without any part of the holster impeding that. I got you, yeah. Yeah, so... And, and what I mean by impeding is that if a part of the holster yeah, came up, here, up and right. it got in front, that would be bad. I yeah, would not yeah. want that. Okay. So those are the four kind of like... Features well, criteria. Hold, hold on, I want to back up because, like, I, I have definitely gotten a lot of shit from people for trying out hybrid holsters, yeah. right? Yeah. But then I've talked to other dudes who, like, you know, your level of quals have carried, you know, undercover or uh, low vis in yeah. in 
actual life and death situations overseas. And they're like, nah, man, you can use uh, hybrid, et cetera. And let me tell you what they say. I'm not the expert, but like, so the two reasons you said not to, uh, the hybrid of the worst are um, the de deformation over time, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, so like you can just, if I'm willing to buy a new holster, let's say every six to nine months, does that alleviate that problem or not? I don't know. It could. I don't know if people do they, just because there are other holsters that do, okay. do it. So, and then also I get this definitely is going to bend, right? And and so putting it in, I, I get. But like if I'm aware of that, it's not speed to put in, right? Because one guy's like, you can't holster quickly. I'm like, who gives a fuck how quickly you holster? You should never you holster quickly, quickly come out, yeah, right? But, but no, have, yeah. like uh, that's what everyone I have ever knows ever taught me is like you should, you're, wh whether any holster, you should stare it all the way through. Absolutely. Go slow, right? So, but if I'm staring at it and going slow, Low, I mean, is that or is it is so it really that big of a deal? It so here's the thing yes and no. Um, what we're asking for is we're asking to eliminate human error, and it's really hard to eliminate human error. Like yeah. in our classes, I'll so, find new ways to fuck up. Oh, for sure. I mean, me too. That's why that's why we try to we put in safeguards to try to prevent that. And and again, history or experience has taught us this. So in our two day class, um, the average the average student is going to make somewhere's in the neighborhood of about 700 draw strokes. Yeah. And I'm asking in that class during that time period that every They're one of perfect. them perfect, almost near perfect. Yeah. So it's really a hard ask. That's a hard ask for me in a class of varying skill levels. I'm not saying yeah. that you Tucker Max yeah, yeah, can't yeah. do that, yeah. but I can't expect, no, I, I, can't, get, I, get I can't create, I can't create protocol. So you don't let people wear hybrids in your class. I will let them. It depends on the holster itself. Like if it's like, this one's got a little bit of extra material. You can see how it's got two layers yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So it's got a little extra, but Sturdy, over, yeah. over time, it's still going to, that's going to still going to have the same. You no, know, it totally will. Of yeah. course. It's, it's, un it's inevitable. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's other things too, like. Uh, they make these without the high sweat guards. Yeah. So you could, if you wanted but to carry then, a hybrid. But then I'm, I got to touch the gun with my sweat. <laughs> Whatever. So, no, but, but, but on, but but on look, a positive, but on a, on an actual, some people's pH balance in their sweat is actually very caustic to yeah. the slide material and to the gun itself. So there are Wait, some. Wait, really? Yeah. There are it'll some. It'll cause malfunction? Their sweat well, will cause it'll, a it'll cause, it, it won't cause a malfunction per se, but it does add. Degrades like, it over time it, or something? It can, it actually, like. We see some crazy kind of rust as a result of that. No. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I have friends that are in the, um, like the the metallurgic business that yeah. do a lot of the stuff on the slides. And there is they they do know that because there's different types of finishes that are yeah, out there, uh -huh. and they had to they had to change the language of their warranties as a result because there were people that were because they were they, sweat was corroding the slide exactly. and we get warranty stuff yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so That's yeah, amazing. it is. So there are people that have a pH balance that is so caustic that it actually can do that. So I can understand why you want to prevent sweat yeah. from getting on your gun with having a high sweat guard. Okay. So, so for you, yeah. hybrids, the bottom, then all leather, then all Kydex, yeah. right? Yeah. Because of consistency of draw stroke, consistency yeah. of retention, yeah. all that sort of yeah. stuff. Now, here's the thing I will tell people when I first started carrying a gun, it wasn't comfortable yeah. at all. Well, that was my next question yeah. was like, okay, uh, even for me, I don't want to be like some people. Me, motherfucker. Yeah. Like if I have to carry an all Kydex, uh, I at least I haven't found one yet. Sure. That's like – and when I say comfortable, I don't just mean like, oh, it's like sunshine and kittens. And, no, I mean like isn't really aggravating. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I have not found an all Ky – and inside the waistband, all Kydex that is not extremely aggravating to me. So where do I factor in like – I don't mind wearing this. I hate wearing the other ones. So I mean – and that's a personal choice. Right. You're, you know, like if I were to have to give – general guidance that's the general guidance that i would give okay uh if you're asking for personal guidance well you clearly have found something that works for you and that is working the one thing i will tell you is that one of the other like it, again like how good do you want to do the job of concealing the gun right if, well that's a question yeah it is how much does that matter well look, it, finish, it, finish this Let's okay get so it. like one of the things about a holster like this is it has girth to it yes that's that, totally that, that girth is adding to it's the exposing. requirement to conceal. So yes. it's making your job of concealing the gun a little bit harder than yeah. somebody that has a, a holster that has a much smaller footprint. Totally. So there, that has to be factored in. So if you were trying to work in a, like if you were, and I know that not everybody would consider this, but 
a gun-free zone could be a supermarket these days. Some some places have said, you know what, we don't want guns in our place at all. Who? Uh, well, I don't know of guns. I'm just saying. Oh, like, they could, some, yes. They could. It's like, the, show me, motherfucker. Well, they, 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 they could say that they don't want yeah. any no, guns true. in their, in their totally, stores. Totally. So you have to make a choice. Am right. I going to... Well, liquor stores, right, and bars. Uh, well, bars that have 51% or yeah, more. Yeah, 51 they yeah, can't. And yeah. so liquor stores, not so much. It, they don't serve liquor. They sell it. Oh, you're right. Just you're like right, in hell. Right. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. like in hell. <laughs> <laughs> so, well done. but, um, so like when you get to the, uh, you know, the girth issue, if you, if you have something that's got a smaller footprint, then you're, you're, you're good, but that you're better off. And what I mean by that is if you're going to go into a non-permissive environment, so in this case, a gun-free zone, like a, a grocery or oh, a department store or whatever, you. Yeah. now you are having, it's way harder for me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, and I'm not saying, believe me, I'm not condoning that you go and violate a, the law a, or the or law people's or, requests exactly. Or but if you want but if to, you had to, it just makes it way harder. It, it makes it harder. Yeah. It, it doesn't, it doesn't make it, it well, I should say it make, doesn't make it easier. Yeah. And that's, that's considerations that I have for people. That, well, so let, let's go. This is a super important question. Yeah. I, I want, how much does true concealment, like, like complete concealment matter, right? Because like, yeah. like the way I carry, I carry two knives, which we're going to talk about in a second. Yeah. One of them's pretty, you can see it, yeah, right? Yeah. And then my gun, if, if you're not, lo- most people don't look, yeah, yeah. but if you, like you would probably see it to me like, oh yeah, that guy's, yeah. he's imprinting quite a bit. Yeah. I, how much does that matter or not matter? So it, it depends. Right. Uh, um, that's a harder question to answer. So here, let's talk about who is out there. Okay. So we have three categories of people. We have your everyday citizen. Right. We have your criminal element. Right. And we have your law enforcement. All right. So law enforcement are trained to look for guns just like yeah, we are in totally. some respects. Mm-hmm. So they're looking for guns. Now, the fact that you're carrying concealed is not necessarily exempt you from their scrutiny. Oh, of course. You know, so th- yeah. you now are bringing extra unnecessary scrutiny to you if you don't do a good job of carrying concealed. All uh, right. So if you don't want cops looking at you, you need to hide. Right. It. In some places, like I had a good friend of mine, he's he's no longer with us, but one of his jobs he, was to arrest people that were carrying concealed and they were carrying concealed illegally. Uh, so, so he had to check everyone carrying concealed he, he so it was legal. He, well, he, what he did was he became extremely um, like aware of tells, both printing and non-printing type tells and body language. And like, so he, he had a extremely high success rate of being able to tell you from just watching somebody walk by them, whether or not they were carrying concealed. Yeah. And so I always took, I always listened to him when he was talking about the criminal element. Totally. In this case, it, it could be somebody that's just like, they're moving through a bad neighborhood yeah. and they just want to carry a gun, but they're doing it illegally. Didn't matter to him. It was a collar. It was, yeah. it was a, it was a tick mark on his roster, if you will. Yeah. So, you know, we, we sometimes need to be mindful that who, what type of attention are we drawing to ourselves, okay. good or bad? So if I have an LTC, I live in Texas, I'm, if I'm imprinting, it's really not going to matter much, right? Or So legally, legally, yeah. no, yeah. it's not going to matter. But then who, who, now we get to the criminal side, right? right. So now- if, Do I want a potential- Criminal, the whole point behind you carrying concealed is the number one, you're the element of surprise. We talk about this in the special operations community, surprise, speed, and violence of action. These are three key ingredients. Well, so what about the, see, I, here's where I, like, again, go this for it, is, go for I, I'm an amateur, so I'm asking, yeah, 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 like, go truly, I thought about that, like, okay, I, I want to, you know, surprise, but then on the other hand, I'm a big fan of deterrence. Yeah. You know, like, people don't attack bears for a reason, right? Well, that's true. And so, like, if someone who's looking sees, okay, like, this dude's got a yeah, fucking, yeah. he's got a big-ass knife that I can see. Yeah, yeah. And he's probably imprinting. I don't know what else that dude has. Maybe I'm just going to get the next person. It's true. That's a that's a possibility. So when it comes to the criminal element, all right, so yeah, there are some criminals. But here's the thing that I would always be very careful about. Like, how much are you imprinting? Because a common trend in the criminal element is where do criminals get guns? Oh, they steal them. Exactly. Oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. So now you are telegraphed for the fact that you actually have a gun on So you. maybe it makes me a target. Exactly. Ah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. See, that's what I'm asking. I think it's a great question I because didn't, I didn't I, think about when that. When you talk about deterrence, is it really a deterrence? My belief is that maybe. Hmm. Maybe it is. Maybe it's it actually depends. an invitation. Could be an invitation. Like there are videos, if you watch videos. Now, a lot of these videos are happening because the people are carrying open carry. Yeah. And I don't recommend that. No, I don't but, like open carry. But, uh, but, that's, but we have to also just recognize that this is evolution in process. Well, right. When a criminal is sizing up somebody and you recognize they have a gun, is that a gun that they want? Well, they'll just bring, they'll put a gun up to your face and say, I want your gun. I know you have one. Oh, so going up to people open carrying and robbing them for the, their gun. Well, 
somebody, you know, some, some of them, they're just going up, grabbing oh, the gun just, out of the holster, taking it and walking out. There's video of this happening at like, like you're at the, the you, you know, you're at the cash register paying for something. Somebody just walks up behind you, grabs a gun and leaves the store. And what can you do? They got your gun. <laughs> well, you have you, right, you, <laughs> but in general. But even then, man, I think twice about going after dude with my gun. But that, I would think that, I would that's think what I'm saying. Okay, about that. I just lost that, you know, $1,000 uh, gun. I guess I'm back to, you know, here yep. I go back to the gun store. I would, I would consider that. I, I'm not sure what I would do. Honestly, I'm not. It, it's a tough call because, uh, you know, they have your gun and they have it in their hand. Yeah. So it's like, shit, what do uh, I do? So I think you need to kind of like, and again, that's the that's the benefit of being in this for a long time. And that's also the benefit of me trying to maintain a very low profile no matter where I go and right. what I'm doing. And I, sure, I make some compromises. My gun, I may not be able to shoot it as fast as you can shoot yours because yours is bigger, uh, yours is heavier. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I'm also not having to deal with extended ranges. That that might be a big deal. Yeah. Close yeah. ranges, like okay. I, so. I make compromises. I make sacrifices in some cases. But I, let me. I, this might seem like a basic question to you, but go. this was a huge one for me and go a lot it. of other people who are kind of just starting to yeah, carry yeah. that I've talked to. Yeah. So like, um, all right. So I carried for uh, learning to carry. I carried a long time. Uh, like first, I moved the gun to my car. Okay. Yeah. Right. And yeah. put it in the car. That's in a the very glove, normal thing. Uh, not glove, but the what, center, middle, console. center console. And then uh, carry, you know, like a fanny pack, like Tim was telling me, because yeah. I didn't know any better. Um, and then, uh, you know, then learned, okay, fanny pack's not going to be super effective for a lot of different reasons. Went to conceal. And it wasn't until I went to conceal that I actually started chambering around. Okay. Yeah. And I'll, ne- dude, I'll never forget the first, I'm not even going to do it in here because it still weirds me out. Like I've been shooting guns for a long time now. Practice a lot, but put the 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 uh, magazine. You know, like I, I I make my magazines with um with hollow points red at the bottom because like red means dead, you know. So like uh, it's like an easy mnemonic. Loaded it and then I chambered it. Like okay, and then put it in my holster. And I was like, dude, it was a weird emotional moment. Like it was actually very, like even carrying a loaded gun. Well, okay, I can do this. Carrying a loaded and chambered gun mm-hmm. was like, and it's not like I was like, oh, I'm on side. Like I wasn't worried about myself. It's mm. just like, dude, this is no joke. This is for real. So, and Look. that's a very, first of all, that journey that you went through, that experience, right. if you will, is something that everybody goes through. Yeah. Uh, so you went through the same thing. Well. Not, or cl- your version of not, it. Yeah, exactly. My version of it. Uh, not, and, and. I guess that maybe not everybody goes through it um, because in the performance of my duties overseas, it was like, yeah, I, guess I, it was, yeah. I don't have, I don't have any, I don't have a option. It's, right. it's gotta be. And, and honestly, that's been my only ever way of loading and carrying a firearm for, yeah. for defense yeah. or offense. Uh, so carrying the choice to carry around in the chamber and I, I leave it, I, you know, I try to always understand the why, why right. is it that you don't want to carry around in the chamber? What were some of the reasons? It, it, it wasn't an intellectual thing because like, it was so funny. I was like, uh, I remember I was uh, at Bill's course, and I, I was like, because uh, I used to uh, when I was carrying in my fanny pack, it was never chambered, mm-hmm. right? And then um, <laughs> I, I did the vehicle class, right? Uh, and then um, what's his face Chantry was like, "Oh, you carry Israeli style." I'm like, "Is that how, how they carry?" Israel, I guess not so, chambered. So uh, a large majority of them, do. right? And so then. Come to find out, like, I was like, yeah, I guess. I didn't, that's not what I, but another military guy's like, no, dude, he's making fun of you. Anytime anyone's doing something stupid with guns, we call it Israeli style. Like, cause I didn't know. Is that true? Well, so, so you got to put it in context to, to, to understand. Yes, it is true, but you got to realize that Israel is a small state surrounded right. by its enemies. Right. And so they have a, a social culture that, Pretty much everybody carries a firearm. Yeah. So to do that at that level, at a nationwide level, with yeah. the millions of people that are there, they opt that the the average person that's carrying has to carry without a chamber. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And that creates a, a margin of safety for them. Yeah, totally. But it's also a cultural thing. They're, they learn exactly from the beginning how this works and why it works that but way. But you're still saying the dude's right. When, they, when the military guys say Israeli style, yeah. it's kind of code so for when, you're doing st- Right. But when you shit. when you talk about like the soldiers and the right. guys that are actually out there on the front lines. No, yeah. they're chambered? Yeah, okay. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Well, so, so I did. And then um, – uh, Bill, like I was at Bill's thing and, uh, he's like, he's, I told him and he's like, okay. And so then, you know, Bill's not, he don't argue with you. He yeah. just shows you. Yeah. <laughs> and so like he put like his hand on my, uh, uh, or he put one hand on his throat, on my throat and he had the airsoft and, and he's like, don't chamber it. Okay, cool. Uh, one hand on my throat, one hand on, on my left hand, like his, right yeah. here and here. Yeah. He goes, shoot me. Yeah. And I was like, fuck. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. <laughs> what would the, the, 
preclusion of carrying an own, around in the chamber or not carrying around in the chamber is that you will have the time, yeah. number one, and the ability. The assumption, yeah. The ability, number two, to be able to chamber around. And I always tell people that gunfights don't, don't go – well, that's true. But gunfights don't happen under the best case scenarios. No. So you need to think about maybe I don't – and here's the thing. Most people don't – like the average method of clearing your cover garment – that is taught in a lot of fields is a two hand method. Two hands, right? We don't teach two hands because you need that weak hand. Yeah, available. you need it like that. You yeah. need a live hand to be able to manage whatever kind of. Th- yeah, exactly. You need to manage your battle space, and that live hand does it. Yeah. Even if it's a defensive posture, like coming up and protecting yourself, it's at least doing something other than trying to clear your cover garment. Yeah. So um, the the reality is that you know you you may not have a second hand available to chamber that's what around. i feel like and it's a I hard did not want to carry had, chamber but it's like dude I'm i've like, had i've had so many people that have come up to me and argued that this is the way they're going to do it and it's this and i'm like well that's fine. i did too and you then i realized yeah. i'm not i'm not going to try to change your perspective that's up to you but let's play this to its logical conclusion uh, it's right it's correct and, like, and, I get but it. that's the thing that you had to have that kind of i had to have that exactly <laughs> <laughs> that that kind of like yeah. primal intimacy that let show other people I need to walk them through a scenario. Yeah. Like, okay, let's do this. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do this? Yeah. How are you going to do this? And then all of a sudden through this kind of like process, yeah. they start to realize, okay. Oh, shit. Yeah. And it's like like the only way that that would happen is if all these variables happened in your favor. Yeah. No, right. And that's very – yeah. you're asking a lot. Yep. No, I, I, I get it, dude. Yeah. And then like, you know, you watch the videos like, oh, some guy comes in if, uh, another st- – I mean there's a million words like if I had to chamber there, I'm dead. Yeah. If I had to chamber there, I'm dead. Yeah. If I didn't – I'm like, all right, all right. It's, it's just – if you're carrying a firearm, it's but, because it's an emergency required tool. You may want – it's uh, like – Okay. The, the, it's not a weird thing to have a deep – Difficult no. emotional. No. Yeah. Like no. it doesn't make me it's a not. pussy it, or no, a faggot no, 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 or a no, no, coward or no. whatever bullshit. Absolutely not. In fact, it I, might. If it does, cool. No, I might be doesn't. a coward for another reason, but no, not no, for no. this. It does not. And what I try to emphasize to people is that you will come to your own decision okay. on your own. Right. When you start to have the because I number one, the adverse effect to that type of dialogue, that right. type of shaming, if you will, yeah, yeah. is that you're probably not going to carry them. Exactly. And, and how am I solving, as a, as a profession in my industry, how am I solving a problem helping you're you? You're making it worse. Exactly. You're making it worse. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, All right. Let's talk about belts. Sure. I'm, I'm totally, so I wear the Tenacore, uh, like the, the one tucks under. It's so simple, man, like super low profile. So, uh, But like belt-wise, what you're looking for sturdy is the important thing, so, right? Yeah. So for me, stability, sturdiness is a, bi- is a big thing. And right. I have – I've gone through – like I have so many belts. Oh, it's dude. almost as bad as holsters. <laughs> no. So um, you can see already that your your belt is developing belt sag. Yeah, yeah. And, and so mm-hmm. like belt sag means that what's going to happen is the weight of the weapon system is starting to – I'm going to have to replace this at some point. I, that, I, that's yeah. just – yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm more – I typically carry more of a stiffer belt. Yeah. And that's just because that's going to carry the weight better. Like the core belts, K O R E. Those no, are super I, uh, stiff. Ares gear is a, okay. uh, the yeah. ones that I will carry. Uh, I'm also old fashioned. I carry a wilderness tactical belt a lot of times. Oh yeah, the 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 leather ones. No, the they're they're nylon. They're double they're double layered nylon, but they're reinforced and uh-huh. they're they're reinforced through stitching and inserts. Okay, so they do a great job of carrying the weight. Wilderness tactical. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's yeah, a, a lot old of dudes school carry, instructor carry belt. leather too because that's oh that's yeah, super I have plenty stiff of leather and, belts. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. it depends on the occasion. Like when I was at in Houston at the NRAs, there's a picture posted of me um, on my Instagram account that shows me in kind of like business casual, yeah. and I'm wearing a leather belt that is designed to help support the weight yeah. in an unconditional kind of right. like un un like not my normal way of carrying. Yeah, I mean, so like you can tell, I'm kind of a comfort dude, especially at least yeah. now in my EDC evolution. Absolutely. Like I mean, because comfort is important. I yeah. I don't want to downplay the importance behind comfort because if you're not comfortable, one of the things that's probably going to happen is that you're just not going to do it. Right. Exactly. And that's not or what we want. Or just annoyed the whole time and it's like – And so if you are, if you go down that road, if you're annoyed – so what we do is we talk about if you're annoyed, then typically what's going to happen is you can do a lot of fidgeting. Yes. A lot totally. of adjusting. Oh, dude, the first couple of weeks I was yeah, carrying absolutely. this, I was – like, yeah, exactly. Like the whole so time. that fidgeting is going to lead to attention. Yes, one hundred percent. Attention is going to lead to What's scrutiny. Wrong with this dude? Scrutiny is going to lead to discovery, right? And as a, as somebody that's trying to carry concealed, that's what I'm trying to avoid. You don't discovery. want that. You exactly. Don't want that. Okay. All right. So so what else? Guns. Be, gun. Pick the gun. Mag. You know, yep. like caliber yep. magazine, mm-hmm. holster, belt. Anything else? Gun. Gun related. Yeah. Uh, you know, not necessarily. I mean, we talked a little bit about the, you know, hollow points for defense. That's, that's something I think if you're choosing a hollow point from one of the big names, just like the yeah, manufacturers, the big names but choosing a hollow point from one of the big names, I think you're good. Yeah. Um, I only, the only thing I encourage you is to do a function test. 
between the gun, the magazine, yeah. and the bullets. And then um, you also want to do, and it's, you want to you want to you want to shoot your defensive ammo for functionality, yeah. make sure it's reliable. But you also want to shoot it because it typically can print or impact in a slightly different location than yeah. what your ball, your training ammo does. So right. do that. You'll get a feel for you know the well. You got to shoot the the. Which I learned this, this is crazy. The the hollow points don't necessarily feed proper. All hollow points some, don't feed properly in all nine millimeters. Some can correct? have some problems. Some right. can. Yeah. yeah. So it depends. Like if you're going for the big names, you, you're you, probably fine. You, you're going to be fine. But here's a problem. Like your training ammunition is probably like 115 grain ball ammo, yeah. right? But you might be carrying like 124 grain or 147 grain. Yeah. So that difference in weight means that it's going to have a difference in impact when you're yeah. shooting. So you you want to know where your defensive ammo is going to impact if you have to make what we call a high percentage shot. Yeah. Like a shot that's like, okay. Can't miss. miss. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. How are we doing on time? We have about five minutes. Okay. What? So go over the rest of what, to me, gun's the most important, right? Like, that's agree. the thing. Yeah. Everything else is secondary. Yeah. What are, uh, I know there's nothing you must have beyond a gun and, and set up for yeah. gun. What are some of the things? Obviously, knives. Yeah, what else? Absolutely. What else? So I, I'm a big fan of knives. Um, I, uh, I also feel like you need to have, these are all examples of deadly force. Yeah, right. I feel like another tool that you need to have exactly is yeah. some sort of... Oh, I, you gave me this idea. Yeah. So right. Yeah. But I, I feel like that's an important thing. Um, so this is a Palm OC. Yeah. And not not pepper spray. No. It's a higher level. It, it pepper is pepper spray, spray but o, uh, uh, pepper spray. That's what OC is. Basically. Yeah, right. Uh, but it is a much more effective form of OC, and, and they've done some great work with the, the their the way that it's carried, how yeah. small it is, and easy it is to use. Yeah. But I feel like having pepper spray, having some sort of non lethal, so that could also be an impact tool. You can have a sap, you can have a collapsible baton. Uh, you can have a set of brass knuckles. Something that is non-lethal is another consideration. Right. Uh, and when people ask me, well, why would I want that? Well, you know, obviously, if I you can... You give me a great example. Exactly. Yeah, you know, the restaurant I, one. Exactly. If yeah. I wanted to be able to de-escalate a situation... Um, Without I, I, killing someone or Right, exactly. I, if, I, if I choose to get involved, but I don't, like... Well, maybe that wasn't the best choice. I, I don't want to make that choice with deadly force. So yeah. maybe OC is a little bit easier. And OC has also got a lot of other, I mean, you can use OC, even though not every dog is going to react to it. Some dogs are very sensitive to OC spray. Yeah. So if you're being chased by a dog, attacked by a dog, that's another good one, especially around here where you got a lot of strays. Yeah. It's not a bad idea. Um, it also just is a great, I mean, in a, in a situation where you can't carry a firearm, yeah. you can't carry a knife. An OC spray canister is a great tool to have. And, you know, it, it, it does, it, it at least buys you time. You know, you can create a, a nice cloud that the bad guy has to penetrate through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if they're willing to come at you after that, their eyes are going to be yeah. really jacked up. So yeah. their sense of vision is not going to be working for them. Yeah. So that you kind of get the edge a little bit. So yeah. OC is great. You know, other people, we talk about flashlights. I, I, I kind of go back and forth with flashlight depending on the situation. Um, it just depends on where I'm at. Like if I can't carry a gun, then I'm more than likely carrying OC um, and, a, and a flashlight. Right. Right. So I like flashlights. At least I have something. I have one handy. It may be in my vehicle. It may be in my desk. Maybe in my carry bag. Right. I at least have one available. Yeah, somewhere. And then about the only other thing that I also encourage is some sort of like medical kit. Right. But I don't encourage you to carry that while you're carrying all of this. Right. right. Because that can get a little, like now they're like, well, Jeff says I have to carry all this shit. And they yeah. put it on a scale that's like 15 pounds of shit. <laughs> right. They have to carry every day. Uh, uh. And just to define every day to us, every day is 80 percent of your life. So if you were to take a year, 365 days, 80 percent of that is around 260 days. Yeah. If you were to take a 24 hour day and break that into, you know, awake, awake hours, that's like 16 hours. Yeah. Of those 16 hours, what's 80%? That's 12 hours. Yeah. So for 12 hours a day, for 260 days plus a yeah. year, you're carrying a firearm. 15 pounds of gear. It's a lot. Doesn't, yeah, it's, people are just not. So I'm trying to create an environment, an atmosphere where, hey, if all you're going to carry is a gun, okay. Yeah. But just realize that maybe you should start to consider a knife. Maybe you should start to carry, um, you know, OC. Yeah. Or the question about spare magazines. Do I need to carry a spare magazine? You mm, know. Probably not. Probably not. But, you know, like, you got to weigh these factors out and right. what is in your best interest what is in, what is it's a needs versus wants yeah. you know i might want to carry a spare magazine but do i need to yeah i might want to carry two knives but do i need to i might want to carry a less lethal but do i need to yeah. ask yourself these questions and really try to like you know like i also tell people to like be aware of what's happening in your area like yeah. like here in the city of austin what are some common crime trends that we see well there's a lot and yeah. you know if you have friends within the 
police force, like, you know, we have Chantry yeah. who's really, really good at sharing a bunch of stuff. You know, you realize, okay, well, fuck, violence, violent, violent crime is, is not on a decline. It's on a rise. <laughs> no. uh, and sp- specific type of violent crimes, you know, so be aware of that. So that means that, okay, well, maybe in this case, because of where I live, the, 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 uh, maybe if I were to live in a different location, I wouldn't feel compelled to do all this. Yeah. But I'm making an informed choice because here, a crime, a violent crime trend you know, it's 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 a high probability yeah. in certain circumstances. You know, uh, go down at night, late night. You're in the bad part of town, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, you're just increasing your risks there. What about when I'm okay? Do you do this? Is I didn't think about this. When you have a, you carry appendix. Where what about where do you carry? So hip versus appendix. Yeah. So there are like there are uh, six different methods of carry. Right. Uh, on body. Yeah. Um, the first is kind of the most popular, which is strong side. Yeah, which is which means uh, hip, three, right? Yeah, three o'clock. Yeah, right three at o'clock, three o'clock yeah. position. So if you look at the clock, face, that's how I carry. Yeah, twelve o'clock being the belly button. Three o'clock is right there on your right side hip for me. And if you're a lefty, it would be nine o'clock. That's strong side. Um, next is going to be appendix carry, which is right around the one thirty position. Yeah. Um, next from there is going to be um, you know sometimes some it depends on the name, but a lot of people call it small, small of the back. back yeah. yeah, small of the back. And then there's cross draw, and then yeah. you know, well cross draw is going to be yeah. on the belt. Oh, well, cross draw is going to be on the belt. Right? Yep, yep. Uh, there's ankle holster, there's yeah. pocket holster, and there's shoulder holster. So those are like the the different carry methods that are out there. Um, overwhelmingly, the most popular is the three o'clock strong side position. Really? I thought appendix. I see most people. Well, you might see most the, the, people. The good people that I trust almost all carry strong three side. o'clock. Yeah, yeah. But a bunch of like people my level yeah. I see carry appendix. Absolutely, a lot. Of, it's a it's kind of like a new trend. They see other people that they may be idolized yeah. that are doing it or they might justify why they might want to do it. Yeah. It's not necessarily a bad position. I carried uh, like the first time I carried down range was an appendix position yeah. without a holster. Huh. Um, it has, it has value. Everything is give and take. Yeah. And the common, common argument for why, why appendix is superior is that it was faster. But we did a, we did an experiment where we tested that theory and we found out that while it was faster, it was faster by hundreds of a second. Right. Tiny bit faster. Hundreds of a second. Yeah. And so really, is it that big of, it, 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 it kind of like, like, that's not why to do it. No, it's the way, the reason why to do it are that it can create a better environment for you to carry concealed. Okay. It can create it's a better environment for some people. Some yeah. people Especially that are. Especially if you're kind of fat, right? It, it, the gun goes over. Yeah, there's that. But smaller, thin frame people that oh, don't yeah, have yeah, the yeah. same real estate on the strong side true, they make yeah. they make a good candidate for carrying appendix um so i i you know while i don't like discourage it yeah i encourage you to start your journey on a safer platform a safer position yeah. which is strong side so let's let's yeah. break that down when i'm teaching somebody to draw from the holster we start off open carry strong side hip and the reason for that is if a student in the beginning has a negligent discharge because they... Oh, it's way safer. Yeah. It's probably going to go in either the leg at worst or the ground. Probably. Exactly. Strong yeah. side. But when you move inside the waistband, yeah. it's now going to... Well, move inside the waistband strong side. Here, right. It's going to still angle. hit your... It's going to go subcutaneous below the muscle tissue, which is a major injury. And then when you move it to appendix, yeah. now you run the risk of not just, you know, the, yeah. the most important thing. Obviously, your reproductive organs are important, yeah. but the femoral artery is a big thing. Oh, yeah. Right. Past that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we start them off that way because because it's a safe progression. It also helps them to be more comfortable with the learning curve that yeah. comes with, you know, drawing from a holster because there's that emotional content that we have totally, to talk about. Totally. So by putting them in that condition to start with, it makes them it, it gives them the sense that okay, things are a little bit more controlled. I, yeah. I feel safer and therefore I can learn. Yeah. And I can then learn how to be safer. Yeah. Not just, you know, be so paranoid or because unfortunately there is a condition where they become a little overly concerned, overly safe, and they actually become unsafe in the process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I could totally see that. Yeah. If you have two folks, it's so you're thinking too much. Almost like that. Yeah. yeah it's almost yeah. exactly like that. Yeah. Uh, Correct. Awesome, dude. This has been fantastic. Thank yeah, you. I my learned, pleasure. I learned a lot, man. It's awesome. so crazy how it's like once you know, you know, but there's this not a lot it's, of this is not at all obvious, man. It like, takes it takes, yeah, it's you know, it's and what I the last if I could share some advice with yeah, people, it's please. like you know, move at your own pace. Yeah. Don't feel like you have to jump it out. It took the- me years exactly. to get to. Exactly. Don't feel like you have to. Obviously, if you were the victim of violent crime, you you may have a difference. Or if there's a known threat against your life, that may be different. But everybody else, I try to encourage you, just move at a pace that you can learn yeah. well and be safe in the process. Yeah. And, you know, welcome. You know, this is a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a liberating kind of experience when you realize that you are, you're it, it's on you, you're responsible for your own safety. And now you have access to all these amazing tools that just give you the ability to, to do that much better. Yep. 
Awesome. Thank you, brother. Oh, I my appreciate pleasure. it. My pleasure.